Next speaker is Nicola. Nicola, please take it away. Hi, can you hear it? Good. Oh, thanks, 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 thanks. Thank you. Applause and a couple of screams if I heard. That's, that's always nice to hear. Uh, oh, and even more. Okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, so, uh, my name is Nikola. I come from Belgrade, uh, Serbia. And this talk is going to be probably a little bit different than the ones you, you've like, seen so far because those were a bit more kind of focused on a single topic, a single problem to be solved. I'm going to be a little bit all over the place, uh, talk about many things that I've uh, tried, experimented uh, in the last couple of years, uh, basically kind of highlighting the process of my like, journey into the proceduralism and uh, how it kind of influenced both my uh, like day job and my, my kind of personal experiment. So the talk is going to be a little bit like this. I mean, I'm old enough to remember these CDs because like, I had no choice when I wanted to like, listen songs when I was like a kid. So you had little, like, I mean, it's called Viva Hits, but you basically get one or two, maybe three good songs, and the rest of it is just crap. Uh, but similarly, I mean, coincidentally, I actually think that the talk is probably going to have the same BPM uh, as a scooter song uh, as well. So my day job actually is working uh, on mobile games. Uh, I came in uh, I like to work on football games, then I worked on a bunch of prototypes, uh, switched to some fantasy games, down and back on football games. Uh, but I also have a night job as well, uh, where I usually like, try to go as wide as possible. I like to experiment, try new things, uh, explore the new shiny things especially uh, as well. And I tend to do also like handcrafted art as much as I can, uh, but also especially like in the last couple of years, experiments more and more with procedural uh, uh, stuff. Sadly, that like, leaves me with uh, almost zero time to do any actual crime fighting. Uh, but, you know, uh, and all that experimentation kind of pushed me, uh, of course, to discover a uh, first tool that, that I kind of added to my arsenal, it, it's Substance Designer. Uh, and when you start learning Substance Designer, what you're going to do, you're going to learn by doing like tiles, roof tiles, because that was like the main, the first tutorial you, you start. Uh, you're going to do your like groundworks procedurally, your, your rocks, your, your leaves. And it was all fun in games. I tried like some other things as well, maybe like some Monster Flash or, or Ammonite Fossils as well. And I did a shit ton of materials in my life, kind of gave them all for free uh, eventually. And I got bored and kind of burned out of, of them uh, because I realized I'm doing all these materials, but I'm not a material artist. I don't want to be a material artist. Uh, why am I doing all of this? Uh, is there something more? Uh, not just to life, maybe to get like this tool. So I started experimenting using designer in different ways. Uh, like, can I make some scenes? Can I do abstract art directly in Substance Designer by like just importing custom meshes in, in its viewport? Like use this placement in an iRay for for a rendering and just like kind of play with that. Yeah, it's cool. Looks nice. I'm a kind of a, not a huge fan of abstract art. It's good for experimentation, but I wanted something with a kind of more more clear uh, end result. So I tried making procedural bookends. And of course, when you have bookends, you have like procedural bookshelves directly in Substance Designer. And and I also tried experimenting more with not scenes, but just play with composition and, and just kind of trying to make the most beautiful image that I can or most tranquil image that I can directly from Substance uh, Designer. So this is just all based on displacement and combining procedural mushrooms and tree bark textures directly in, uh, in Designer. Uh, I also have some experiments where I tried like uh, modeling in Designer uh, as well, which is becoming, I think, more and more popular. So you basically use textures to model stuff. This is kind of a uh, quick test that I did, I wanted to make like a procedurally based uh, uh, short movie, but I never finished it. This was as, as far as I, I kind of managed to get be before I switched to a next uh, shiny thing. But back in my day job, uh, at the time I was working on a, a mobile fantasy game uh, called Heroic, and I was working as a VFX artist. Uh, and if you know like VFX, especially in mobile games, like especially in our game, you have a lot of VFX uh, inside. And uh, back then we used to use this prehistoric tool to, <laughs> to do uh, like textures uh, for, our, uh, for our VFX. And if you've ever made any VFX, especially for mobile games, you need that, you know that the quality of your VFX will directly depends on the quality of the textures that you use for that VFX. Because basically VFX in mobile games is some fancy, uh, or actually some simple uh, models, some fancy textures, they scroll, you color them, and maybe you use a particle system if you really can, uh, can afford it. Uh, but like those textures need to be, you know, like 
really nicely crafted, they need to tile properly, and like you need to have at least some level of, of uh, like ability to be, to be agile while producing them. And using Photoshop for that is far from ideal. And so I was on, like, on this mission, hey guys, like, I'm learning this tool, like, can I bring it back to the team and show it? So I, th this was actually the moment I became like an evangelist, like, oh yeah, you need to try designer, we need to do that. Uh, luckily, there was a contest called uh, The Great Transmutator, uh, it was organized by the real-time VFX community, and I was like on this challenge to do the VFX completely procedurally, both meshes and textures, and I wanted to do all the building blocks uh, inside Substance uh, uh, Designer. Uh, I think that I've, I have succeeded. It has proven as well as a, as a test bed, uh, but I didn't want any prizes, uh, sadly. I mean, like obviously there were like some, uh, some contesters which were like better than me, uh, but what happened is that uh, other people in my team, in the company, they saw the potential. And we adopted this tool uh, moving, moving forward, and it helped us a lot. Uh, and from that point on, like basically almost every VFX that we like, added to the game since, uh, at least to a part, to maybe completely relied on Substance Designer for, uh, for, for texturing. And I was like, yeah, procedural victory number one. I made a difference, I feel good, that's, that's awesome. So that part like, continued like, living on its own, and back on my night job, I was like, what are the other cool things that maybe I can do procedurally? What are like, other maybe aspects of game production or maybe marketing that I can like, help optimize or maybe relieve some pain points? So I tried doing graphic design procedurally in, in, in Substance Designer. I mean, yes, technically you can do it. Should you? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> Because, yes, it's cool, it's, it's, it's nice to kind of come here and talk that, hey, here's, here's a nice procedural design that I did, but there are many better ways to, uh, to do it. Uh, I also experimented with animation directly in Substance Designer uh, by like, like relying on the, uh, on the time variable. This is even more difficult to do than graphic design because just the tool is not made for actually doing this. But the cool thing is like, I always hated like uh, doing motion graphics in, uh, in After Effects, it always felt a bit more like, like, like waterfally. I couldn't change things that easily. And I wanted to try out what, but what if I rely all my motions on actual like noises and procedural textures? And then you can actually do some transitions. And you know, I, it helped you prototype some stuff uh, rather quickly because, for example, this transition is based on, a, on a, like, an isotropic noise. You can just change the noise and get a completely different looking uh, transition or, or your, your motion graphics uh, look. And of course, since I couldn't stop there, uh, I have this uh, huge like, passion towards like, electronics as well. I used to play with like, Arduinos and LED displays. And the problem is, as I grew old, uh, I started like, I couldn't be bothered to actually code any of the nice you know, like, graphics for, the, for those LED displays. So I figured, why not just consider them as like, like GIF players or like slideshow players? And then I tried like, like actually making animations in Substance Designer and then exporting that as a literally like a slideshow to the, to the LED display and then use that to, to play the animation. And that also worked because it took me like, I don't know, 15 minutes to do this in designer and exported images, but actually to code this, to run on the device, I, it'd probably take me a lot more, uh, lot more time. But this kind of proved to me that even though the tool is marketed as a, like a texture, texturing tool, it can be way more than that, of course. Like you can do basically a lot of more, a lot of more things. And then back on my day job, uh, luck be it, uh, there was a non-texturing uh, problem that needed, to be, that needed to be solved. So uh, same game, that fantasy game, we were trying to develop this feature, which was supposed to be like an endless saga, uh, like a player versus environment, where you could like, scroll infinitely through, a, uh, through this like, fantasy map world. And we were like, wondering how can we like, draw a map which is infinite? Uh, can we have variation? Can we not? Like, what we need to do, and I was like, "Hey guys, can I can I try like generate a, a map?" And I made a, like a, a small proof of concept. Uh, this was actually more of a distribution problem than actual kind of generation problem because I had my artists like help me like actually draw the elements, uh, like mountains, ra ranges, uh, stones, trees, and stuff like that. And I made a tool in Designer where you can just like kind of draw your land shape, your land masses, and it will automatically generate the the map uh, uh, for you. I was like super proud of this, like, like, this, like everybody has to like this. I mean, what's, what's not to like? It's like a map generator. Everybody likes, likes both maps and generators. If you combine the two, that needs to be a win-win, right? Uh, sadly, the feature was kind of scrapped, 
I spent so much time, nothing happened, so I was kind of bummed, but yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's move on. I, I like, even had the help of a couple of my development friends. We made a prototype, actually, in engine. Uh, we used Unity at the time. So this was kind of how it was supposed to look inside of the game. You could like, just like scroll through the levels infinitely, infinitely. You could see your rewards and stuff like that. But that didn't happen. Um, so that kind of pushed me along the side of, okay, uh, maybe like just like procedural texturing is not enough, maybe I need to add another dimension, maybe I it's the time to start learning procedural modeling. Maybe that, that's the thing that can help me kind of uh, be even more kind of versatile in the tools that I, that I have. So along, this, along that time, I started learning, learning uh, Houdini, and I like went straight like in, I'm going to make procedural characters in Houdini. That's like the first thing that you should do <laughs> when you open it because that's the easier. Uh, of course, I, I didn't make any procedural, but I realized that I could at least kind of import the ones that I have, either like scans or maybe sculpts from the, from the game, and manipulate them uh, into some uh, like variations of the, of the characters as well. Uh, so, but that was kind of motivational. I, I saw the, uh, the potential like immediately. So I said, okay, maybe characters not the best thing. Let's try to make some procedural environments. Maybe I, I, I'll be better than that. And I was better than that, probably because I had some experience at that point. So it, some things were easier to uh, to do. But I kind of felt that the tool set was way better, kind of oriented toward this kind of work, at least at the skill set I had at the uh, at the time. And you can see some little bit of overview. Uh, for the environment that, that, I made, uh, that I made for, for this. So this also kind of, again, pushed me back to my day job influence. So this was the, the, the arena that we had in the game. It has like three lanes, you spawn your enemies, they clash and stuff like that. And again, we had this game vision at the time that we, were, we wanted like to have many environments, uh, many styles, uh, three lanes, two lanes, you know, like influencing game design as well. And we're constantly debating like how expensive will this be? Because we want small teams, we don't want to expand. It's, it's a, like a very young game in development. What can we do? What can we not do? And I was like, cool, let me try to maybe create a prototype where we can create those environments uh, procedurally. Of course, like Houdini was the perfect choice for that. Uh, not only that, we could like automatically push them. This was like before, I think, Houdini engine. Uh, you can automatically push everything to the, to the game, just export the meshes, automatically reload, and you, can, and you can just play. I even went to some details which are really not important, like how to distract the columns in the middle and stuff like that. But again, it's a proof of concept. It really kind of changed the, how people thought about game production in the, in, in the, in the company and kind of made like, the, the buy-in uh, for a lot of my artists who were more tend towards traditional way of, uh, of, of working, you know. So I'm also like trying to raise that procedural awareness in the, in the, in the company. Uh, and like sadly, uh, the game was kind of like re reshaped uh, its, its vision. So some of the things end up like kind of being used in production, but not in a state that you, that you see here. This was just a prototype. So it's still not a huge victory for the game, but I had a couple of small victories uh, uh, as well. Uh, at one point, the game team was kind of a bit shrinked. We started working in two-week sprint. Uh, we are trying to kind of fix a lot of stuff uh, on a per-sprint uh, basis. And one of the features was just kind of designing a lot of uh, items that you can like equip to your heroes. And it was like, again, like a discussion, how can we produce so many items, like uh, almost like 100 or, or even more, uh, in the shortest amount of time, ideally in a single sprint, which is two weeks. And uh, again, Houdini to the rescue. Not even Houdini, even like Substance Painter this time. So what we did, we took like all the sculpts that we had from the characters we developed, we just kind of transferred them uh, into like items. Uh, we didn't care at, at all about anything else aside from like the high res uh, sculpts. We put everything into the into like single folder. Houdini can like check the folder, see if there's anything new. Takes the model, does automatic like unwrap, uh, remesh, uh, does the, like the ID maps based on basically uh, on the size of the individual uh, elements, and have, we have this kind of material hierarchy that used to kind of uh, like donate what's the uh, the rarity of the uh, of the object. We gather all of them, we put them in this huge substance painter file where we have like smart materials already ready for for all the kind of type of the of the items and we just render them out. And within two weeks, we, we, this is how they, they end up looking at the game. Within two weeks, we created like 100 and something these cards that you can collect uh, in, the, in the game. Uh, but the biggest victory, actually, that I personally felt really proud of uh, was the features that we called like uh, achievement badges. 
It's a thing that when you achieve something in the game, you get the reward. Uh, but by design, like those badges are supposed to be like a like you really wanted to collect them. They should kind of feel like a badge that you, of honor that you can like actually wear and and, and hold. So they they should have like be tangible. Uh, but they also be, have like need, needed to have like context to the actual task that, that you had to do. And the scale went crazy up because like okay, items we had maybe like 100, but badges was like 300. And we was like, okay, how can we do that? We already used up all the, <laughs> the, the, like, the models that we had for the, uh, uh, for the items. How can we ach uh, achieve badges? Like, we cannot like, render and be agile about uh, producing all of these things in, in two weeks. And we actually didn't render it. Like, all of these badges were actually made directly in Substance Designer. Now that is like a 3D model. Everything that you see here is either based, especially the backgrounds are kind of like directly generators made uh, in Substance Designer. And the, like the foreground elements are uh, baked from the height maps from the 3D models. Everything was then like plugged into the Substance Designer and rendered there. Substance Designer has this really cool node called like PBR render node. Where you can like plug in your material and plug in an HDR map and you get a render like, uh, like this. And this was like super fast. Like we could like within 15 minutes we can like do some like really nice concepts, either like completely procedurally or like using uh, like alpha maps or height maps that we had, like the views for sculpting or for texturing. We can just plug them in and see how that works. We can even do like light look, like uh, light look development just by plugging like different HDR maps and like the feedback is instant. You have like zero waiting for rendering time and even material look dev. And you do that and you have like. 200 badges in, the, in, in two weeks. Uh, this kind of the process you can see for texturing and everything. So everything was based on height maps, everything was done in Substance Designer and exported from, from there. And you can see how this looks like eventually in the, in the game, it has a different viewpoints uh, uh, as well. And uh, Luckbeat, the same process was actually used to get some even like nice looking like marketing materials as well that we could use in the, in, in the background, basically free of charge because we already have all the elements uh, uh, ready. And especially luck be it for me, we came back to those maps <laughs> eventually. But now since I was armed with my completely new 3D arsenal with, with Houdini and since the feature a little bit changed, uh, we redid all the maps uh, for the game for that feature uh, using like regular Houdini uh, uh, high fields uh, work. Uh, but since my like knowledge of texturing Houdini at the time was really, really, really bad, uh, I did all the texturing side of the, the side of designer, so I just kind of exported the height maps from from Houdini, and everything from that point on was done by by designer, and then just rendered as a displacement map. And it was pretty easy to kind of set up like four different uh, biomes uh, for the game. We ended up doing I don't know around 50 trains, uh, something like that. This is how it ended up uh, looking in the in the in the game. And I think that this kind of this blog post about this specific feature was what, get, what got like kind of side effects uh, attention uh, because they called me to, to kind of work on them on the, on the Dawning project which is kind of Mars uh, short movie that they did. Uh, but this was like a completely new challenge for me because uh, it had to, it, I had to kind of work with height fields on a completely new level of scale because you, we had shots that were like, com like literally close as, uh, to, to the feet of the astronaut uh, and all the way is like a large, uh, large vistas. Uh, but luckily Houdini could just kind of churn, uh, just it didn't care. Like whatever I, I threw, threw at it, uh, it just kind of handled everything perfectly. Uh, you can find the, the actual kind of dawning video on the side effects website. It's a little bit of process. But what was new in this uh, in this specific task is that uh, since like it's, you, you know height fields, you cannot do overhangs. So it was really nice kind of to start, try to ex like start experimenting how to like take specific part of the height field and just convert it to a to a to a cliff. Uh, you can see a little bit of that process here uh, as uh, as well. But yeah, so let's go back. Still, my texturing capabilities in Houdini were not that good. So all the terrains that you see for the dawning were actually textured in, in Substance Painter. I just export everything as, as, as UDIMS put to Painter. I have like smart materials there already prepared. It was, it was very little, a very like small amount of actual kind of manual impact after that. And we just export everything else for, uh, for rendering. But uh, side effects said, hey, how about like creating a proper tutorial so we can like share the techniques. I was said, yes, let's do it, but I want a texturing cops. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so what I actually did, I kind of, kind of took everything that I learned from those processes and I made a tutorial. And 
Actually, COPS, I mean, I would never do it again, but it wasn't that hard. Uh, it was like when you take Substance Designer and maybe like, rotate it 90 degrees, you get <laughs> COPS, uh, kind of, sort of, but it worked. And you can find the tutorial on the, on the Side Effects website. Uh, I'm, I'm actually proud of it. I kind of covered a lot of bases uh, there. And I did uh, like, the whole breakdowns for, for these three biomes, you know, like the desert one, the snowy one ones, and the, like, the lava flow uh, ones. Back in my day job, I, I was like, like I'm back to, to now, like, the, the fantasy game was kind of, well, not canceled, but kind of I was moved away from it. I was back working on football games, uh, especially on a, on a football, like, engine part of, a, of, of our kind of top 11 game. And, uh, okay, it's football, it has kind of challenges. Uh, I'm, I'm, like, leading a small R&D team at this point. And I have this thing that I kind of like to contribute uh, however I, I can. Uh, for example, I used to kind of spend I don't know, uh, lunch break here and there, just kind of making wallpapers for the company, just to kind of, uh, at least kind of raise uh, more, like motivation, inspiration around the company. And I had some friends, like me included, who really kind of like synthwave music. So I was like, hey, let's make a synthwave uh, wallpaper for the, for the company. I, I know that a lot of people would like it. And I was like, okay, Houdini has like OpenStreetMap data, maybe I can use that. And it works perfectly. I mean, if you just kind of import the OpenStreetMap data in Houdini, you get all the layers already separated that you, that you need, and you can just kind of take it from there, extrude some, uh, some uh, like buildings, add neon lights, make everything super, super glossy, and voila, you get a synthwave uh, generator. And I liked it. I even kind of, I was like, cool, I can like make a synthwave version of every place on Earth. What can I do with this now? And I, like, I went on Twitter and I said, hey, like, people, like, send me your GPS coordinates and I'll send you a, like, a synthwave wallpaper of your location. I think two people answered, because, <laughs> like, in, hinds in hindsight, uh, it's not a good thing to ask people where they live <laughs> online. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, you know, I did, like, I think this is uh, London, this is Rome, and this is New York. Uh, I just stopped there. Uh, but again, you know, I was, like, I was trying to, to find out, like, how can I uh, inspire myself and, like, and, like try new techniques uh, with, the, with the things that I had, like, laying around. And since I was working on a football game, we had a, a lot of mock-up data proprietary that we did for the, for the football. And I was like, cool, animation. Like, I never done anything about animation in Houdini. Maybe I can play with that. But maybe I cannot be it only like a technical challenge. Maybe it can also be like a stylistic challenge. And it was pretty cool because I could like take an animation and see how I can like destroy it. <laughs> Uh, this is made using like, just like a regular Vornoi uh, uh, distraction, but and then like the whole animation was done uh, using like mops fall off and, and rigid, bo rigid body uh, uh, simulations. And I enjoyed these experiments because like you can do them fast, you can just plug in a completely different mocap and you get completely different result. And it was also a stylistic exploration for me because I could do even things like this. Uh, where I wanted to do like something which is more like a sketch looking, not necessarily kind of broken looking. This was based on the like uh, just kind of generate silhouette, then just kind of a little bit of a random sorting of the elements and like connecting based on point number to kind of try to simulate some, some cross hatching. Uh, and then like a bunch of distorted copies to add some variety uh, around. Uh, this whole kind of animation thing. Uh, ended up being like this wallpaper for the company, which was kind of really popular to certain people, uh, which was just like a, like a kinetic sculpture that uh, I enjoyed making. Uh, but that kind of got me thinking since, like, I'm not an animator, but I would like to animate. Can I do procedural uh, animation? Is that something that's maybe doable? And this was kind of a perfect project for me to, uh, to test and, and, and try this. Uh, I, did, I did like this as a, as a kind of VR sculpt uh, demonstration, but I was like, I want to animate this. I want to add a little bit of life to it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's on a loop. I think it's very charming. Uh, and I actually kind of decided, okay, let's try to animate everything. And I did it. I, I animated everything. This was my first experiment with, uh, with chops. Uh, luckily, like once you're, you're kind of used to uh, like well, both mathematics and node-based node approach, uh, it's not that difficult to, uh, to pick up. It's just, you know, like layering up your, 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 your functions, your, your waves, your, your noises, and just kind of a little bit of clever parenting and then pure positioning, and you get what you, uh, what you need. Uh, but this then pushed me into making a lot more small little, little robots. And when, you, when I started making small little robots, I realized that I need some tooling around those robots. So I made a sticker bomber because I wanted all of my robots to kind of feel a little bit post-apocalyptic, like people abuse them, put stickers on them. So I made a sticker bomber because I wanted, I don't know, I just thought it was cool. Uh, 
So yeah, this is like, it was a tool kind of made in Substance Designer, but you can use it in Painter. You can just kind of load any basically atlas of, of stickers in it, and it would work, automatically separate them, and then just bomb it. You can adjust your regular stuff like scale, rotation, and even like a cool adjustment of how much uh, wear and tear there is on the, uh, on the, on, on the, on the stickers themselves. Uh, but again, uh, tooling, modeling robots, I was like, maybe I can make like hard surface modeling a bit more approachable for me as well. So I experimented in Max by creating like, Max had this new retopo tool uh, implemented, and I thought it was a good thing to, sh to try something I wanted to do uh, like before. And I just kind of prototype a little bit like a shadow box uh, based kind of hard surface uh, modeler. Uh, it's based on, on splines which kind of intersect and boolean each other. You can just kind of adjust the splines to, to, to get the shape that you, that, you, that you like, and you just kind of make a copy to the, to the side uh, and, uh, and kind of retop it. Uh, I mean, of course, you can do very, the same thing in Houdini. I've just kind of, because Max is my kind of, the, the, the tool which I started with, I thought it would, it would be kind of funny to try out workflows uh, there. And to prove the concept, I basically used the tool to kind of try to model something specific. Uh, in this case, uh, it's just a gun, kind of modeled with specific parts using that kind of a light, light box, uh, shadow box feature, and then just like, like retoppled in, in Max. Eh, I think it turned out kind of, kind of cool. But, you know, eventually, pandemic hit. Uh, I didn't want to make kind of robots and guns anymore. I got locked in the room with, with, two, of my, with, with two kids. Uh, like, you start, you know, uh, revisiting your priorities at that point. Uh, so, but I found this incredible book, uh, which my kids got for, uh, for present. And this is a fantastic book. I enjoy it so much. It has so wonderful, like, illustrations of, of, of plants and leaves and everything. I think it's like inspirational gold mine for anything that you want to generate uh, uh, procedurally. So uh, I kind of I tried to make this into this kind of kind of family building exercise as well, where I would uh, like let my kids choose what you're gonna like build that uh, build that day. Uh, and uh, so we started like and like trying to explain the the like procedural methods to a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Uh, okay, <laughs> never mind. So we like build a lot of things procedurally. All of this is done and actually and shaded in Houdini and, uh, and Octane. Uh, things turned out nasty at one point, so I kind of scrapped that project as well. But I liked like teaching people. Uh, so that year at, at, uh, at the uh, View conference, I made a workshop about like making a hazard generator because I was mesmerized how, how the, the Pixar movie Luca looked. And I wanted to make a generator for those townhouses. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to kind of share the actual workshop uh, pretty soon with you. Then, like, November hit. Uh, for you who, who don't know, like, November is this whole, let's say, like, a challenge that you have that you can, like, create uh, uh, some assets uh, using any node-based uh, tool. And I really tried to push myself uh, uh, for this because I, for years I've been promising that like, this year I'm going to do November, this year I'm going to do it, but I finally had some time to actually do it, and I, like, I, like, pulled all my horses and said, like, I'm going to try, like, Houdini, I'm going to try Substance Design, I'm going to try combinations. And, like, it really, I think, turned out some pretty, pretty well uh, uh, pieces uh, for November. You can find all of this in end breathing breakdowns as well on, uh, on our station. You can try doing some, like, functional user interfaces as well uh, on November. One thing that, that, that November proved fantastic for is that I had this folder, this, this like, work in progress folder, which has tens of, of like maybe even maybe like, like 80 or 90 projects which I started and never finished. Cool thing is I dumped all, most of them <laughs> during November. I just kind of picked the thing which I never finished, see if it can be reused, and then I've reused it. And this is something I'm working like currently. I'm uh, trying to build this scene. It's kind of handcrafted, but it needs a lot of kind of proceduralism uh, on top to, uh, to finish it. Uh, because like I'm generating like textures for the displacement, and I also build a lot of tools uh, as well, like a broom tool because I want a lot of brooms. That's they're, they're wizards. I also build like a pumpkin tool uh, as well because like the Halloween uh, was around, and also build like a potion generator uh, tool. I mean, in general, they're basically the same concepts, but I was like trying to expand them and, and do like uh, different things along the side. And this one I'm pretty happy because it gave pretty pretty like nice uh, nice results. And then I got a new toy, I got a plotter, and now that I have like completely new rabbit hole that I can go down in. Uh, and now I'm like back to maybe where I started, and I'm starting to like see how can I use Houdini for maybe more something which is like line art and abstract art or plotter art and stuff like that. And like 
Even touch designer is one of the experiments. So this is my rabbit hole at the moment. I'm using Houdini to create like abstract line art. And like I, I'm, I gave myself a task. I want to do like prepare an exhibition, which I want to open. Uh, and that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. And now I can take a sip of water and breathe. <laughs> uh, I mean, like you saw, I didn't cover like, any of the like, in-depth technical stuff, but I'm here. So if you want to chat about anything like, more technical, feel free to, to do so. We'll do one question uh, in the audience and one question online. No questions online, then two questions from the audience. Ramon, I'm coming. So, uh, hi, thank you so much for that talk. That was uh, exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, was cool. I, I know. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Um, so, you've done uh, Substance Designer and Houdini. Do you have any other tools that you're looking to or that you're curious to try out? Uh, yeah, so currently I'm exploring Touch Designer, uh, which is because I'm, I'm kind of curious how can I like, start doing a little bit more like uh, audio reactive and real time uh, setups uh, with procedural stuff. And it's proving out to be like almost similar to Houdini. I, then I, I figured out it was probably developed by the same people at, cer at certain points or something like, like, like that. Uh, so Touch Designer is pretty cool. It's basically like a small version of a real-time uh, Houdini. Uh, other than that, I don't have any like specific tools on my horizon yet. I think I'm already <laughs> like a little bit over, overwhelmed. Uh, but I am curious to see where uh, uh, where AI goes. That's, I think, my like, next big iceberg to, to kind of climb and see where that goes. Good luck. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I'm going to need it. Um, I'm mind blown. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, there are so many uh, questions in my head. Um, but mainly, uh, you worked as a mobile game designer and in your main in your free time you still manage to do all of these other tech like everything <laughs> yes um, why did you why do you still with the mobile industry game industry and how do you find yourself uh, time for creating all these new uh, amazing yeah art pieces yeah Okay, cool. Uh, that's a very good question. The question that I like ask myself from time to time. Uh, the truth is, like, I like I love my day job. Uh, I love it. I, lo I love the people that I work with. They're like a huge bunch of really, really smart people. We are working like on very successful products. Uh, like we have like great stuff, great opportunities to like try new things. And uh, but uh, I mean, yes, it's it's it is football. So it's it's this case is kind of like let's say creative like challenges to, a, to an extent, uh, but I also find that as a challenge, you know, like how can I like make this more interesting to, uh, to me? So it's like a cool job with cool people. I'm still like working at, like, you know, at my home country and uh, especially I have like, let's say like luxury uh, because I've been in the company for, for 10 years uh, that I can you know like uh, explore these kind of things and start like pushing changes like from the ground up. And, uh, quite recently, I started like leading that small R&D team, which basically has like two jobs. One is like let's help uh, make games like better and faster, and second job is like let's fundamentally change how we produce and how we how we work. And that's like really where my passion uh, is. And how I find time, uh, I sleep very little, to be to be honest. Uh, I mean, I don't have a time machine. Nobody does. So yeah. th that is the that is the sacrifice I kind of very willingly kind of made. Uh, I just enjoy this more than, than sleeping, and it's, it's, yeah. it's not ideal, uh, but like years of freelancing with like Far East and Far West, has kind of, they have kind of conditioned me to not sleep that much, so that, that's the trade-off I take. Yeah, it looks like you're very intrinsically motivated, so, uh, yeah. uh, yes, I am. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. you had a question? Oh. Thank you very much, that was a lovely talk. Thank you.